On this edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast, we'll give our biggest takeaways from the Red Sox four-game sweep of the Yankees. And we'll talk about whether you still should have concerns about the Red Sox ability to succeed in the postseason. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast. I'm Ricky Doyle, joined as always by Dakota Randall. Dakota, uh, this week it's really going to test your ability to poke holes in the Red Sox team. I'll find a way. Uh, Because they, I guess you could say, made a pretty emphatic statement uh, over the weekend. Did they, though? uh, Well, We'll that's what we're going to get into. A uh, a four-game sweep. Of the New York Yankees, lead in the American League East now up now up to nine and a half games. They're eight games ahead of the Houston Astros for the best record in Major League Baseball. Uh, firing on all cylinders, but uh, yeah, we're gonna get into it. We'll, we'll give our uh, we'll get into the takeaways here of of that series, and also just to take a bigger picture uh, approach to what the uh, what the Red Sox are doing right now. It's pretty historic season thus far. Um, so so let's just start with the the series in general. Very broad view. Um, what was your biggest takeaway? I mean, we'll get into, obviously, the, the details of what went down, but it, uh, the totality of the four games, what's your biggest takeaway? Uh, my biggest takeaway is that the Yankees are kind of soft. And, I mean, I, I still... I, d- I, I tend to agree with that, but I'll let you go. From a talent standpoint and from the way the teams are built, like, I still don't know if if there's truly a nine and a half game separation in talent between the two teams, I still think they're, they're relatively co- close when both are fully healthy. And I mean, we'll get into it in a little bit and I still, you know, I, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you the, you know, the Red Sox aren't better than the Yankees. I think they're clearly better, they're clearly a better team. I mean, they're in the driver's seat for the American League East. Um, and, it, but I mean, I still think you have to worry about the Yankees in the playoffs. And I think everybody does. But that said, I mean, there were just a lot of things this series that if you're a Yankees fan, you have to be concerned about. I mean, they were just, whether it be the way they just laid down and got mud over by Rick Porcello on Friday, and I don't want to take anything away from Rick Porcello, but, I mean, the Yankees looked, you know, they had a little fight in that game. They had nothing against Nathan Nivaldi. You know, they showed a little bit last night in the ninth inning Saturday against Kimbrell, but, you know, they didn't seem to show up to Fenway Park with the same fire as the Red Sox, the same passion. Uh, they didn't seem to want it as bad. And it seemed like once the series started going against them, that they sort of laid down and folded. And, I mean, I suggest we'll see a different team at Yankee Stadium later in the season. But just, just the fact that they have the capacity within them to show up to a series this big and be so easily rolled over and just roll over and die, I mean, you have to be worried about that for a Yankees fan, because, if you're a Yankees fan, because... You know, you just wonder how they're gonna how they're gonna do if they face real adversity in the playoffs. And you know, I think overall we can look at the Red Sox now and say, from a chemistry chemistry standpoint, you know, from you know how close they are as a team, from an attitude standpoint, sort of that intangible factor. I think the Red Sox have that in spades over the Yankees. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we we can conclusively say that at this point. Well, it does. You know, it, there's a little bit of a, a a chicken and egg thing, I guess. You know, whether you know, the chemistry and uh, that fire kind of comes from winning or whether, you know, kind of it's the other way around. Like, what, what comes first in that scenario? I mean, it's easy to be all, you know, have the best chemistry in the world and have this, this passion for the game when you're winning seemingly every night. But I agree with you about the, the Yankees. This team just, they look a little off. There's something off yeah, there's about something them. something weird about and them. And so that's why I guess my takeaway is uh, it's pretty much the same as yours, I guess. But... It's, and it's kind of twofold. It, it, you, you learned that the Red Sox, all season we've kind of been searching for that, uh, I, don't know, I don't want to use the, the phrase it factor, but I will because there's really nothing else to call it. But just for them to show some balls, some right. cojones. And to be you know completely I mean? I honest. I think they did that this weekend, whereas the yeah. Yankees, on the other hand, they leave, uh, really leave me questioning their uh, intestinal fortitude, I guess. And to be honest, some, in some ways, this Yankees team – reminds me of the Red Sox teams of the last two years, where I don't doubt that those guys individually care about the game, they want to win, or they have personalities. But there's something about, whether it be the way Boone leads them, or the pressure in New York, or sort of the whole Yankees thing, you can't grow facial hair, you can't have your number on your jersey, you can't do this, kind of saps you of your personality. It just seems like there's something missing there, and the team doesn't really have an identity, or any sort of you know, personality or overt passion that they show. And, I mean, to be honest, it reminds me a lot of the Red Sox the last two seasons, and you can say maybe that was a refle- reflection of their manager 
and it seems like this season this season's team has really taken on the personality of Cora but you know and I think when we watched the Red Sox the last two years we recognized they were good but we always thought there was something off and we couldn't quite put our finger on it and that's the feeling I get when I watch this I think it is 100 percent uh starts at the top kind of the taking on the identity of your manager I mean the Cora coming out and getting ejected in that game Friday night. I mean, that's just just that whole situation right there and how he handled that, the post-game press conference, the, the questions surrounding that. I still don't get the quality start. No, I, it was I, the weirdest I, thing. I mean, I think we should make that obvious, a meme. It was an obvious shot, but I'm not sure what this, like, I, nobody really explained to me where the quality start is. <laughs> the, ba- for the basis for the shot. You know I, I, mean? I think like what we should do is now every time like a, an opposing athlete comes into New England and puts up a dud, like if LeBron comes it's, in and shoots like five or yeah. five or you know fifteen, say quality start. Yeah, Sam Darnold <laughs> comes in and throws four picks. Yeah, yeah it's a quality start. Yeah, but um, I, yeah, but I, I like Core's uh, Core was chippy this series, and he seems to he, you know. He, I, I think it's rubbing off. And, yeah, and on the other side, Aaron Boone looks. He's just got such a dare and headlight looks to him. Like, it's it, it constantly, I mean, I mean, let's not act like managing the Yankees is easy. The Red Sox aren't easy to manage either. But, I mean, that's a tough job Boom went into there. 100%. But Without any coaching experience prior. I, I just, I'm not seeing, I mean, not just from the series, but the season as a whole. Like, I just find, I've always found it awkward, like, I don't know, Aaron Boone just strikes me as this kind of an awkward manager. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing that Some stood out... Some of no experience, yeah. and, and that's the guy that you... I mean, at least Cora, the, the, the rumblings, he's the bench coach in Houston, obviously had an immense success there. Uh, Well-respected across the game. Not that Boone isn't, but I, I don't know. It's just it, the, the idea of Aaron Boone coming in and getting in Giancarlo Stanton's kitchen if need be just never really was an, you know, an optic that I could wrap my head around well I don't even know if core necessarily has that either like I mean maybe he does maybe he doesn't I can't picture him for for instance you know getting into the grill of JD Martinez or David Price or something like that but you know what I do think is has really stood out to me is the is the accountability you know when the Red Sox makes make mistakes core has gone right out and 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 you know been honest about it whether it be in the media or just you know holding them accountable you know when Devers made that base running mistake uh, a couple weeks ago he, he was, you know, honest about it, saying, you know, wh- where we're trying to go, we can't have that. When Jackie Bradley Jr. had his f- you know, famous slide in, in Friday night's game, he, uh, you know, Cora was honest and said, you know, it was a bad base running play, and he basically saved himself with a great slide. Right. And when the team makes mistakes, he doesn't hide from it, and, you know, he holds the players accountable, whereas every time it happens on the Yankees, whether it be, you know, when, when Gary Sanchez didn't run out that, that, that grounder, Boone said, I didn't see the play, I have to look at it. When Glaber Torres didn't run out of uh, a ball over the weekend, he said, don't know, I'll have, to, I'll have to go look at the replay. And every time there's a thing like that, he says, I don't know, I'll have to look at the replay. And he, he kind of, he, you know, he's not nearly as direct as Cora is. And, and like you said, that's, that's a top-down it's, thing. You've got to hold guys accountable. It feels sheepish. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's an easy way out. It's just, it's just I, I don't know. It's a cowardice way to go about things, I guess. And, you know, maybe, that is, maybe there is something to be said in that sense for you know when when the Red Sox hired core one of the things people said you know could be a big benefit is his ability to relate to to Latin American players whether it be Bogarts um, you know Christian Vasquez you name it any of the guys on the team you know that come from Latin American backgrounds and and you know Devers and you know sort of getting on their level and speaking with them and, and giving them someone to relate to and you look at some of the Yankees young young stars and some of the, you know and some of their bigger profile players a lot of them are, you know, Andahar, Torres, Chapman. A lot of those guys, you know, that they're also Latin American. And you wonder if Boone, I'm not saying he doesn't have that ability, but you wonder if that's a gap too. If Core kind of has the edge up there where he's able to relate and manage a variety of different personalities and backgrounds, whereas you wonder if Boone really is, isn't able to connect with everybody in that clubhouse. Yeah, I don't know. The Yankees just look like a team that's kind of railing right now. Like, there were certain instances throughout that series too where, like, there were just little things that you would see and, like, and you just – it made it would make me feel uncomfortable from a Yankees perspective. I mean, like even just something as small as like Giancarlo Stanton facing Nathan Evaldi in that game and that pitch up around his head, you know, to start off in a bat, and then he just looked completely out of sorts for the rest of the AB. Like he just yeah. was back on his toes, uh, back on the, you know the heels of his feet, 
And then just the young players with miscues. Obviously, the the Andrew Howe one on Sunday night leading to that was the, more on Greg Bird, if you ask me. I, I agree with you, but but Greg so, Bird but even, stinks. But I'm even Greg Bird, on Greg Bird is the this future Yankees thing, first baseman. Which Greg I Bird think has stinks. been kind of overlooked he, in this whole. Well, you can, okay, uh, Greg Bird go ahead, stinks. get it off your chest. No, he just stinks. Go ahead. All off season, I heard Greg. Oh, you, you know, Yankees, these young players. Greg Bird, first baseman, power hitting when he's healthy. He can be a star. Great bird stinks. That was a crap play by him. It was you a gotta crap make play that by... scoop. Oh my God, he's I'm sick. He of lunged him. more than he Greg should have. Like, it, was just, it was an ugly play. All it was around, just his really. name, Greg Bird. But I think, yeah. it it goes to a bigger issue, and I think it's something that's <laughs> underplayed a little bit. I mean, we can talk about how these two offenses stack up, the rotation, and the Yankees bullpen gets a lot of play. The Yankees team defense sucks. It does. It's not good, and it's not. I don't even know if it's so much of a skill thing. It just seems it goes back to the. I think it's some of it's mental. I think it's just. I, I don't and let's know. not act like the Red Sox are, are. You know, they don't make mental mistakes too. They make plenty. I would say. And that, for, I mean that JD Martinez. The, the Red Sox are far better. But I think they're, the, for, for, from what I've seen this season, they're the worst base running team in baseball, and both can hurt you. I mean that JD Martinez getting caught at second base. The I other don't night, necessarily agree with that. I mean, they're pretty bad. They've ma- they've made. They've ran into more outs on the bases than any team in the last three seasons, and I think they're. I also think. I mean, you look at this series. I think base running was a huge part of what happened this weekend. They, I mean, they were relentless. You know, sensing well, an opportunity. And I don't mean stealing bases. I mean stealing bases is one thing. I'm talking about just stupid, careless mistakes. I, like when when Martinez got thrown out at second the other day when he got caught off the bag. And then I forget who hit the ball after that, but that would have been a run. And you ended up getting a double and driving him, those guys in anyway, so it didn't matter. But you see those kind of things all the time. And, you know, you, you can live with those, but just those are the things that will cost you playoff games. Defense I, as well, yeah. don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I, it's just for me, it, it comes with the territory. I'd rather you – I mean, I agree with you. There have been some instances where they've just been, you know, made boneheaded plays on the bases. But, I mean, I like the aggressive nature of – you know what they've been doing especially this this past weekend so i, I mean if they're if with that comes some you know some some damage or you run yeah. into some outs I'm, I'm all right with that i like the trade off so but, at this point do we think the a at least is over but uh, yeah, uh, yeah you do yeah i do yeah because I, the thing about this red sox team is that i mean you look they don't lose series first and foremost. they haven't lost three in a row all season long they don't lose series and they don't when they do hit a rough patch, they don't let things snowball. They really I mean? only hit one rough patch this season. They got a crap schedule for the re- the rest of the way. Anyways, for I mean, the most the Yankees part. do too. The Yan- Yankees have the crap. The, the Yankees the, have the easiest schedule. The easiest baseball schedule. Red Aaron Sox are in there too, but but the Red Sox have, I believe, the third easiest. Yeah, but they also have Astros, two series with the Yankees, another series with the Phillies and the Braves. So, I mean, the good it's opponents just, they face are pretty good. So we'll just see. A nine right. and a half games is, is a is a wide margin. For a team that doesn't let things snowball, right? It's just hard for me to envision them collapsing to that extent. I mean, I, maybe they only win by they win the division by three, four games, or, or right. something like that. But it's hard for me to. I mean, it would be a historic, a monumental collapse. But to all the Red Sox fans waking up Monday morning and, and celebrating and dancing on the Yankees' graves as if it's as if the thing's over. I mean, be careful because you know. I mean, for instance, I saw a tweet from Gordon Needs uh, that on this date. In 1978, the Red Sox led the uh, led the division or the, the league, whatever that whatever it was back then, uh, by eight and a half games. Right, and then that ended up being oh, the, the Bucky Dent game. Yeah, uh, obviously, the collapse in September of right. 2011. Yeah, on this date in 78, you were up eight and a half, and then the Yankees end up winning it the, thanks to Bucky Dent. Just so a, it can happen. The the nine well. and a half game lead is as broad a lead they've had in the division since September of 2013. Uh, yeah, I mean. All know what happened that year. Right. Obviously, a World Series title. They haven't held a, a broader lead in the division since July of 2007, uh, when they reached a season high, tying 11 and a half games that season. Um, obviously, we know what happened that season right. as well. So, I just think you can't. Just some context. Yeah, they need to be. I just, you know, I worry that one. I always worry about peaking too early with any team in any sport. I worry about peaking early, and I don't know if this is peaking too early with, with the Red Sox because this is how they played all season long. But I think it's still more important to be hot in September going into the playoffs. But I just they, they can't let off let off the gas. And I just you know I'm not saying I'm worried, but I just hope they don't go. Huh, we, you know we, we swept the Yankees, we're good now, and they kind of back off because you know you got six games against the Yankees at the end of the season. And if that series, if you if you kind of let it get down to like you said four or five, and the Yankees are within striking distance there, suddenly those games you know the intensity ratchets up again. And I'm not saying you're no, going to collapse. I think the cushion is. Is big for this team. It is because it is. I mean, you look around and 
a, a, the Chris Sale being on the DL, I mean, you can having this type of cushion afford you to be extra careful with him, extra careful with all these guys that, that have been dealing with hamstring injuries, the 700 yeah. guys on the DL with hamstring injuries. Which And two bummers, too. I was yeah, I really liked having Blake Swihart and Ian Kinsler on the field. I liked that lineup. And so it's a bummer that yeah. both are on. And that was a – Tough break for Swihart yeah. in particular, you know, finally carving well. out a role, playing well. And honestly, before he – not not to go on another Blake Swihart tangent, which probably are my favorite tangents to go on, but I, what was it, uh, Thursday night's game, uh, when he, I forget who was trying to steal second, but Blake Supplier threw an absolute bullet to second to cut him down. We don't see him, you know, through seeing him gun down runners isn't something we, you know, we've seen a lot out of Blake Swihart. I, I don't want to say it's been perceived as a weakness, but when he made that play and, you know, the way he called that game and the way he's called games recently before getting hurt and he was on, what, an 11-game hitting streak, I started to wonder, you know, when Christian Vasquez comes back, you know, what, what, what they would do. I mean, if Blake Swire's hitting that much better and he's proving he can call games and, 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 and be good defensively, you know, I wondered if, they were, if Vasquez was just going to walk into a starting spot again. But now that Swire's hurt, you know, they might kind of come back close to the same time. We'll see what happens. But it is, a, it, it is tricky. It's bad time for Finding time for three catchers in your rotation. But I think that Swire is, I mean, prove that he need, he should have a role. What it is is, you know, I love Sandy Leon. TBD, but and I, I think he and you know, we've heard enough out of the Red Sox pitchers to know that the whole they love pitching to Sandy and Sandy calls a great game stuff isn't crap. I mean, there there is there's absolutely it's something there. Enough evidence there, there that's there's something to it. I wonder and I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but or myself, but I wonder if next season we're going to see a Swihart Vasquez tandem. I'd love that. I think that's that always be, seemed like it's been the long-term approach. That would be pretty cool. For whatever reason or another, it's never really gotten to that, you know, right. gotten to that point. But not to go – all right, I'm, I'm, to come back from the Blake Swire attention. It, well, so but, it, we're, we're kind of on the same page with, you know, what we took away from this weekend being that you know, the Red Sox are finally showing that, that kind of extra ingredient, I guess, that we've, you know, sat here and wondered whether they have it, that extra gear. You know, we've said – countless times that we want to see them step up in a big series against a good team. Yeah, I don't this think is what we've been talking about all year. I don't think more of a statement than, yeah. they, than what they made. Uh, the, the, the variety of ways in which they won. I mean, you had uh, two fantastic pitching performances by Rick Porcello and Nathan Uvalde. They had Steve Pierce jacking three home runs. Which was just ridiculous. Uh, on the Thursday night in the series opener and the offense going off. You had the come from behind win. So just... A lot of things. It's twofold, like I said, with the Red Sox showing that extra gear and the Yankees, on the other hand, looking just like a team that's a little bit out of sorts uh, and kind of goes, it's kind of a continuation of what they've been doing over the better part of you know, a month and a half now. I mean, there, right. there's been points with, and let, let's face it, let, let's not, let's also make note that the Yankees are were without Gary Sanchez and without Aaron Judge. Um, but that's not an excuse. You were without your guys, too. I, no, but I, yeah. I mean, I feel, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Yeah, I mean, you have to believe point. if Aaron Judge was in that series, maybe, maybe one a, little bit different. a little bit different. But so, um, so I mean, I think overall, the we're, we're both pretty, you know, understandably positive about how things went in the series, and Red Sox fans are too. That said, I left last night's game with some of the same concerns I've had all season long. And I'd like to know, you know... Well, I was going to say, now that we've got, like, that overarching, you know, feel-type thing out of the way, like... We should focus more on r- more tangible things. Yeah. And I think I know where you're going. Well, my thing is, listen, it's great to win a game against the Yankees in August 15-6. to six. It's great to have Rick Porcello go, you know, have a complete game, one hitter on, what, 70 pitches. It's great to have Nathan Navaldi shut him down on a Saturday afternoon at Fenway Park. And it's great to have a ninth, three-run ninth inning comeback off one of the best closures in baseball. It's, it's great to do all that and sweep the Yankees. That said... I, I just don't think you can bank on those types of games playing out in the playoffs. In my mind, the way that game was until the Red Sox came back in the ninth last night is more akin to what you're going to see in the playoffs, especially if, they fa- if you face the Yankees. And for me, it just gave me, you know, it, it, it still left me concerned with how the Red Sox are going to be able to handle a good team, and particularly the Yankees, but any other really good team uh, that has a good bullpen and, and you know, that's battle-tested in the playoffs because we saw they had a one nothing lead in the seventh. I think Alex Cora overmanaged. I think he left Price in too long. I, I don't hate the decision to leave in Price simply because, you know, I think he wanted to try and get another out, have Price leave to a standing ovation. He's kind of trying to manage his player in that way. 
and and you know Price is a tricky guy to manage. So I understand it. I don't think he would do the same thing in the playoffs. But I think he waited too long. I hated going to Heath Embry personally. I know me and the guys in the office differ on that. I don't. I think the inherited runners stat with Heath Embry that everyone throws around is garbage because it's accumulated against bad teams and it's coincidental anyway. And so, you know, I think you have to go to your better relievers there to win the game, whether it's Barnes, Thornburg. I don't know, maybe, I don't know about Joe Kelly, but, you know, I, and, and obviously we saw what happened. You know, Heath Embry blew it up, and the Yankees were able to shut you down with their bullpen for much of the game until Chapman. Robinson shut you down, Zach Britton shut you down, Dallin Batanta shut you down, and those are the kind of things you're going to face in the playoffs. And yes, they made a great comeback, and that's great, but those don't typically happen in the playoffs. And I just, I look at that, you know, the one game out of that series where I can, I can look at it and say I can take a real takeaway from this and you know give me an indicator of how things might look in the postseason was that game last night and there was some stuff out of that game that should concern you if, if you're a red sox fan because you're going to get close games like that in the playoffs where you need you might only get one run and you got to find a way to make it last you can't is, bank on making a three-run comeback off of one of the best closers in the game no but let me ask you this how does the yankees bullpen scare you is it from a red sox standpoint absolutely absolutely especially does. if zach is it's Zach pretty Brinnett, clear that that Rawls Chapman is not the same against the Red Sox as he is against the rest of the league. No, but he's, he's also filthy. Don't get me wrong. Right, I'm not saying that he isn't, but his numbers against the Red Sox, not good. Right, but let's also not forget you're not you're not playing every playoff game at Fenway Park in the playoffs. No, but you you know you're, you're going to have to go to Yankee Stadium. Series with home field advantage. Right, and that, that's a big thing. Don't get me wrong, but you know yes, the, Chapman has had some tough outings against the Red Sox, but he's also had good ones. I mean, Mariano Rivera was a guy, just because of the familiarity, Mariano Rivera used to get knocked around from time to time against the Red Sox, but you still weren't comfortable going against him for the most part. I mean, you, you can't just assume you're going to, you know, beat Chapman like that. I don't know what was up with Chapman, too. He was sweating bullets. He always is. I've always but looked he, at, he always does. It's the strangest was, thing. He looked like a man who was very uncomfortable. He looked and, like he crapped his pants. And it's instant, too. It's not just when the <laughs> pressure ramps up. It's first pitch of the inning. Yeah. It, it's pouring off of his head. It's like cartoon sweat. Just it's just beating off. It's disgusting. Cat dripping. He might be the most disgusting player in baseball for a variety of reasons. <laughs> it's, uh, it's true. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, you can say there's some interesting uh, closers that for con- on contending teams. And you get you factor in the Roberto Osuna thing in Houston, right. but that's a whole different story. Um, it's just I don't know. I, it's, when I watched it last night, I, when the sixth inning was over, I was I was excited because I said, "All right, this is going to be the first game, the only game in the series." where you know we can learn something we can we can learn something about how this team matches up in the playoffs and we can see how alex core is going to manage his bullpen and i you know i knew that i knew he wasn't going to do it but i would have loved to seen barn seven thornburg eight kimball nine like that's just the way i think you should do it and the way you'll probably do it in the playoffs and the fact that they messed around with bringing price out in the seven they're leaving him in too long and then bringing in heath embry who's i mean i, I don't want to be too harsh on him but i don't think Heath Embry's all that good you know, it, it, it just, I looked, I'm like, well, you know, there you go. This is the first time in the series you were tested and you came up short. Yes, you made the comeback, great. But that was the first time in the series they were push and tested with the, t- the intensity, really ratcheted up. And, you know, we saw what happened. And I yeah, think it I should mean, concern you a little bit. You're also overlooking the fact that he should have induced a double play ball with Xander Bogarts made his first fielding, ever, fielding error of the season. Like, the game still would have been tied, though, but you're still right. Still would have been tied, and then say so you get out of that, it's a whole different story. You're not talking about this implosion that you're making it out to be. Right, but that, that I mean, ball that, was... It's tailor-made double play ball. Right, but that ball also was right hit there, hard. Run scores. Right. I agree, but the next ball was... Get out But of that it. ball was hit hard, and the ball by Stan was ripped. I mean, Henry didn't have it. He was all over the place, and I mean, the most disgraceful thing, and this had to drive Alex Cora crazy, is that the nine, the number nine hitter, Robinson, is, you know, he, what is he, like five, well, there's no five eight, a hundred pounds? And he, three pitches in a row that almost went up his nose. Right. You know what and I mean? Like, you, you have the number nine, a little leaguer, who's trying to give you an out, and yeah. you walk him. It's is not, any, I mean, that, that has to drive less Cora intimidating nuts. than his little stare back at the mound, too? It was pretty bad. Twerp. I mean, you like to see fight out of him. No, I, I mean, I, I agree, and I, I, I mean, say this When Bedroya does that, not, you like it. But. I'm not very physically imposing in stature either, right. so I can't be one to talk, but it's <laughs> just like, what are you doing? Yeah, I know. I would have been pissed, too, if I was him. I mean, you're just, you're basically, you know, you're squaring around like that, and you get three balls right up near your jawline. Like, get yeah. out of here, dude. I also Just think, the ball over the plate. I also think, uh, one, I also think, and we heard A-Rod touch on, touch on it a lot in the broadcast, you know, they, they need a lefty arm in the bullpen. 
And, you know, whether that could be Eduardo Rodriguez, it could be Drew Pomeranz, it could be Brian Johnson, it could be any of those guys, and that's fine. But they need, they need a lefty in the pen because a lot of the better, a lot of, a lot of the better hitters you'll, you'll face in the playoffs are lefty. And, you know, I just, I don't know. I, the bullpen still worries I, yeah, me Yeah, I mean, ideally, you, you, you have a lefty. I mean, right. it, which is why I'm anxious to see. This would be on my, I guess, to-do list from here on out when you're trying to figure out what, you know, Obviously, you you got to make sure you secure this division lead if you're the Red Sox. But you know, if you're getting your ducks in a row for the postseason, I'm taking a good long look across the league right now and trying to add to that bullpen. Still, even with the trade deadline, the rearview mirror. I mean, we've there's still moves to be made. I mean, the biggest move made last year turned out to come in August, the whole Justin Verlander trade. Right. So a few moves. You know, Sean Kelly getting traded to the the. Yays uh, on Sunday, so just there are guys moving around. So right, I, it's not going to be. I'm not expecting some splashy move by the Red Sox, but yeah, ideally, I'd like to see them add a lefty to that bullpen. Right, I think if one, it's you know they need another arm. When we said it before the deadline, I still believe it, and you know I just still think the bullpen management could be better. And I mean, again, Alex Cora is a rookie manager. We all love him right now. He, he got thrown out of a game. It's great. The love affair with Alex Cora is real, but. You know, he hasn't been perfect, and I think his bullpen management at times has been iffy. And, you know, when he brought in Henry in that game, he should have had somebody up behind him, like, already. Henry should have been warming up with a second guy because this, you can't go into a situation like that just confident, oh, Henry's going to shut this down. No issue. Absolutely. There's no reason why we'd have another guy up. You know, I think, yeah. I think Brazier should have been up or Barnes and... You know, just because the, he, we've seen Henry before, he, you know, he can't, he, like I've been saying, like the, a lot of these guys in the pen have issues throwing strikes in big spots, and, and Henry did it in New York, and he did it last night. And I just would like Alex Cora to recognize that a little bit more and be a little prepared, because last night was a game where you didn't have to worry about taxing your bullpen. They hadn't worked all series. You could let it all out. If they don't go out and add a, a lefty to this bullpen, it is, I mean, it's pretty clear that they're banking on at least one of Pomeranz and Rodriguez. I think it's going to be Pomeranz. Figuring, you know, maneuvering into that uh, that role as you get into the playoffs. But, I mean, it is kind of interesting to see what they're going to do. I mean, you, in theory, you could have both of them looking at a bullpen role. You're kind of figuring right. out between the two because the way Uvalde's pitching right now, he's kind of working his way into a playoff start. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, you're looking at him. Obviously, Sale Price, Porcello is the other three. And then that leaves you with Pomeranz and, and Rodriguez to kind of figure out down the stretch. And then Stephen Wright, God only knows what, you know, he's a righty, obviously, but, you know, we don't really know what his situation is. Right. So th- that, that's another one for me is kind of on the to-do list is to figure out what these guys are. Right. I, mean, I think you're right. I think Pomeranz is probably a guy you're most apt to see kind of serving that lefty role in the bullpen. But I'd be lying if I said Eduardo Rodriguez and intrigue me a little bit. What right, you could get from him out of the bullpen. My only thing with Eduardo Rodriguez is he always seemed to struggle in the first innings, especially with his control, and that's that stuff you can't have in the first inning. That said, I mean, I still have more confidence and in the, him than the, Pomeranz. And there's the experience factor there as well with Pomeranz right. having had success in that role before. Ro- Rodriguez came out a little bit last season as well, and I thought he looked pretty good. But, you know, I mean, it's going to be interesting for them because assuming that the, the starting three in the wild card round are – Sale, Price, and Porcello. I mean, you're going to have four starters potentially. Uh, you, I mean, even Evaldi. You could have Evaldi, Johnson, uh, Rodriguez, Pomeranz, and if, even if you want to throw in Stephen Wright into that, you could have four or five guys. So it's like, I mean, you wonder if they're even going to, you know, maybe that's why they weren't worried about adding a bullpen arm because they're like, well, we're not going to go to those guys anyway. You know, we have Kimbrell and we have a couple other guys, and we're just going to use these leftover starters because that's what the Astros did last season. Yeah. I don't think that's it's, the model, but. Oh, well, maybe it is. I mean, they, like. I think obviously Alex Gore had a first-hand look at the Astros last year, being their bench coach. Spe- uh, like mentions them practically every day. It seems like I right. mean, he's referenced that Astros team on so many occasions this year, and so I mean, maybe he he likes the idea of probably of being able to mix and match with these guys, just get this collection of arms, and once you get to the playoffs, you know, see what happens. Um, but yeah, so overall, did you learn more about the Red Sox and the Yankees this weekend? That's a good question. Um, I mean, we've kind of poked around and, you know, given our takeaways. I, I would say the Red Sox. I would say the, I would say the Red Sox. Like, I, I think, and it, it kind of speaks to the Yankees too, but I think, you know, we, we can confidently say now that this team, they, they, you know, they have an it factor, they have a spine, you know, they're confident, and, and they're, most importantly, really, really, really good. 
And I, like we, we've been waiting all season long to see how they would do against good teams. The Yankees up until this series have played well against good teams. Maybe this is a mirage. I don't know. But the Red Sox, we've been waiting for this to see them go in and make a statement in the series against a good team. And, I mean, this was it. So I, I think absolutely you, you learn the most about the Red Sox this series. Yeah. I mean, I agree with all those sentiments, but I came away from the series embarrassed for the Yankees. I really did. I thought going into that game on Sunday night that if you were going to have – I mean, I don't want to just push this narrative that it was just so prevalent throughout the course of this weekend that you know, the rivalry's back and – yeah, you know, this is all this bad blood in the Friday night. It was, you know, I think that got kind of blown out of proportion a little bit. But I think there's a little bit of tension there, at least. There's, to a certain extent, I think there's, there's some sort of, there's something. There's something that... I think it's just that they're two had, good teams. And That's it starts it. with that. I think right. it's obviously going to start with that, with really any rivalry. I mean, right. it's hard to have a rivalry when one team is much better than the other team. So I think it starts there, but I think there's probably a, a little bit of a chippiness. Uh, and... and just for the, the Yankees to get run out of the, the building like they did. I right. thought if there was any night for them to respond and maybe come back and put one between somebody's numbers, it was in that Sunday night game. Right. I mean, you just you, you were embarrassed all weekend. You need something. Come out in that first inning, maybe, maybe come out with a little bit of a purpose, a purpose pitch. Uh, and they didn't do it. Uh, still ultimately almost secured a victory and then just gave it away again. I mean, it just... It was just a very telling series to me from a Yankees perspective that this, it was embarrassing. It was absolutely right. embarrassing. But again, I would say, you know, don't get, don't get, a, don't go crazy, Red Sox fans, with all this reaction. I mean, even the Red Sox themselves. I mean, some of the tweets this morning, I mean, they keep tweeting the standings. They keep, like, woke up like this or the shrug emojis. You know, they were rubbing it in pretty good last night. And that's great. I like it. I love it. I love it, too. And I like the social media back and forth. Um, but just, you know. Be careful, because we've seen this before, and uh, while you probably should coast to a division win now, you know, I would just, don't, don't I, set yourself up for, like, just complete and utter devastation. One more thing, too. Because it's not is, beyond the Red Sox <laughs> to, I, to break your hearts at the end. Yeah, yeah that's true, but uh, the Yankees' rotation, not great. No, you're right. And I mean, Tanaka has pitched his ass off lately. I mean, really good in his last, you know, 13 starts or whatever it is uh i'd probably trust him as much as anybody in a one game wild card that was i mean an interesting question too that they kind of touched on in the espn broadcast at the end you get into that one game wild card who you who are you rolling out there who are you more comfortable rolling out there luis severino or masera tanaka absolutely tanaka and and beyond that tanaka's always pitched well against the red sox yeah tanaka, he always the red on, sox. it's kind of a shame that he he struggled with so much with injuries over the course of the last few years because he there are times when he's filthy. He's pretty the guy nasty. Throws fastball thirty percent of the time too. It's interesting to just watch him pitch. And the Red Sox as a team seem to have big trouble with split with uh, you know the splitters, and then maybe a lot, a lot of teams do too. But something about Tanaka, he always seems to carve up the Red Sox. But, but I mean, outside of him, Sabathia's usually had their number. But I mean, I think he, he's never really instilled fear in me from a Red Sox perspective and. Severino's have it, has had his issues of late. Sonny Gray now officially bounces the bullpen. We ripped on him time and time again this yeah, season. Yeah, he was chucking it up in the bullpen Did you see last him? He's night laughing. A big old grin on his face. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like Lance Lynn's going to be in there. He had the rookie <laughs> chance at throwing a rookie out there in your biggest game of the season uh, on Saturday night. Jay Happ dealing with his hand, foot, and mouth disease. Like, this, there's just there's some questions in that rotation. Right. Um, I mean, from top to bottom, you are a, a, a superior team to the Yankees. I would, and I would say largely so. The only thing is, is that the playoffs, especially now, seem to be won by bullpens, and it just worries me. You know, if the Red Sox fall down early, three to one, four to two, whatever it may be, and then you know the Yankees will just pull their starter in the fourth or fifth, and then they can go Robinson for one or two, Zach Britton, Batances, and Chapman, and those guys are perfectly capable of shutting you down the rest of the way. And I don't think the Red Sox have the, the you know the, the firepower to do that out of their bullpen. And so that, that's just the one thing that worries me. But, you know, they might get up early in every game, and their starters might go deep. You know, we'll see. But I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's these teams have, you know, for as up until, you know, recently as tightly contested as this division has been, you, you, can, you can draw similarities between the two teams and how they're positioned for success and all that. It's pretty clear that there's two very different philosophies at play here. I mean, if you're the Red Sox, you're relying a lot on that starting rotation and minimizing the amount of work that your bullpen gets. 
For the Yankees on the flip side, you want to get to that bullpen. You want to just right. get what you can out of that rotation, get to the bullpen, shut it down from there. And even from an offensive standpoint, I mean, you're, if you're the Yankees, their ability to hit the long ball, well documented, obvious, you know, especially once you get those two injured sluggers back in the lineup. Red Sox, on the other hand, for as much power as they have, much more, you know, much different offensive approach. The, the way in which they manufacture runs is a little bit different. Right. Which I actually trust the Red Sox offense more than I trust the Yankees offense going into a, a playoff series. Because I think the Yankees offense to me is just, it's prone to, to go through a stretch of, you know, four or five games where you're not going to get, you know, if you're not hitting the long ball, you're not going to get the runs. I mean, we've seen it. They were, up until they scored those runs off Heath Henry, I mean, they were searching for anything, really, right. to get that offense going. I just think I, I, it, it must happen. Teams go teams go quiet during a series. No, I get it. Like it but I just it, it, and I've said this before. It would not shock me if you get into a playoff series and all of a sudden you know you're three games into it and Stanton is 0 for 14 with eight strikeouts and Judge is you know, one for 12 with nine strikeouts. You know what I mean? Like right. I I could just see a scenario in which that happens. You talked about the Red Sox offense and one of the you know, an interesting development that I've seen over the past few games and, and, and really, you know, since Steve Pierce came here is, you know, I wonder what they're going to do, you know, their, their, their game one lineup. Like, I, I still believe they'll put Bradley Jr. out there, but you have to look at it and think, you know, your best chance for success right now is Benintendi left, uh, Betts in center, Martinez in right, and you can shuffle those around a little bit, and then more than at first, Pierce at DH, Devers or Nunez at third, Kinsler at second. Like, I just, you know, I wonder if Bradley, Bradley Jr. is going to get squeezed out here when the playoffs come around. Because when they have, when they have Pierce in there and, and Kinsler, and, you know, instead of having, you know, Bradley in the lineup, I, I just, you know, I mean, they're, they're much more potent offensively, especially just in terms of driving the ball outside the ballpark, putting up crooked numbers. And I just think it's interesting to, you know, to monitor going forward. And even, Mitch, I mean, Mitch Moreland's struggled pretty bad since the All-Star break. Predictable, he does it every season. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a legitimate platoon now. I don't think, oh, uh, Miss Warren's not your everyday it starter. It's full-blown platoon. And, and with Pierce having, you know, his production where it's at, it's even making it difficult to take him out of the lineup against right-handers. Right. I mean, obviously with the three home runs on Friday night, they come back, start him on Saturday. I, I, there was really no way on the God's green earth that he wasn't going to be in that right, lineup can't Saturday. Right, Yeah. Um, and then he delivers so with another he's homer. Just, maybe he is. He's forcing the hand, he's forcing the issue a little bit. You know, maneuvering his way into more playing time. Uh, whether that ultimately is a detriment to his success, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. S Steve Pierce has a track record. We know what he can do. He hits lefties. Right. But I, that. I just and you know, I think Jackie Bradley's been better recently. No, I mean his average is up somewhere around two fifteen, two twenty. So I mean, he's definitely playing better, and he's been, been more consistent in the last month or so. Um, that said, you know, I mean, w w when he goes up against good pitching, especially against left-handers, I mean, he, he's overmatched. And I just, you know, I just wonder if when, when it comes to it, when the Red Sox go into the playoffs and, you know, they want to give themselves the best chances to win, what kind of lineup they're going to go with. It'll be interesting. And if Jackie Bradley's not in your starting lineup, what a weapon to have off the bench. Right. Got you know, runs pretty well. Obviously, the, the defense, right. I mean, a very useful piece, regardless of whether he starts the game or finishes the game. Right. Uh, and I think that's another thing that separates these two teams. I think the Red Sox is deeper. Yeah, they're absolutely deeper. You know? Yeah, they, they have a better, yeah, they're, I think they're much deeper. Their rotation's deeper. You know, They've been able to weather the field, these, these mini storms without really any hiccup whatsoever. Which is crazy. I mean, we've never, I've never seen a Red Sox team wide to wire be this good. Yeah. It's, it's really fascinates me that They've never won 100 games in a season. In I think they're on pace for 113 right now, right. which would be one short of the Seattle Mariners' they're, record. So just a, a few things kind of coming out of their uh, post-game notes Sunday. There's 79 wins of their most ever through 113 games. Uh, fifth team in the expansion era, which dates back to 1961, to win as many as 79 of their first 113. Uh, you know, 18th team in MLB's modern era, which is from 1900 on to win as many as 78 in their first 112. Uh, of the previous 17, 15 went on to win the pennant. Uh, that's 88.2% of the teams. So in nine have won the World Series. So 52.9% of the teams that have won as many as 78 of their first 112 games have gone on to win the World Series. So 
pretty decent odds right. from a historical perspective. Uh, but so, some of those that the, we, we talked about, you know, our big takeaways, and, and I just want to go to another one that's really stood out to me. We, we've seen this all season long, and it feels obvious at this point. But it just, again, it's, it, it's glaring how much of a difference J.D. Martinez makes on this team and makes oh, on this lineup. Just insane. from a confidence standpoint and, and an approach standpoint, I mean, you know, when, when, you, when the lineup turns over, and, you, and you're, especially la, last night in the ninth, you know, the whole time you're thinking, okay, if, you know, when it gets to Benintendi, if he can get on and somehow you can get past Pierce and you can get to Martinez, you could win this game. Yeah. And, la, and you, had, you didn't have that. Line. You didn't have it with Hanley. You, I've never had it with Hanley anyway. And... Whoever else was being put in there, I, Mookie, I never thought was as good out of the cleanup. When Bogarts was in there, whoever they had in there, just it wasn't the same thing. And with, with JD Martinez in great there, great at bat by Steve Pierce, by the way. To, great at bat to uh, to set up the you know what ultimately happened, the JD single and uh, the the error, but and so walk it, by Leon. People talk about the three home runs. Steve Pierce, great at bat on Sunday night. Right. Steve, it, Steve, but Steve no, Pierce I, is a good player. But I, I agree with you though. There was. It just There's feels different. different when you're watching the game because you're like, oh, the lineup's coming back around. That means Betts and That'd Martinez. Be- and, I mean, Ben Intendi, I mean, we all know how good he is. But, again, he, not, maybe not getting enough credit for hitting 300 with 14 homers. He's played good defense, stolen 20 bags. He's, He's having been, a really, really good season. All around, great season. He's and, insane of late, too. Yeah. I mean, and it he's just, just been playing out of his mind. But I think J.D. Martinez has made all those guys better. And, you know, we hear all about how he's been, you know, these hitting meetings and, you know, all of his stats and all of his books and all the stuff, all the, the hitting nerdiness that's going on over there now, thanks to J.D. <laughs> Martinez. And you just feel it when you watch the team that, you know, it's, they're not going to – rarely do you feel like they're going to have an, a, a down night offensively just because of the presence of, of him in the middle. And, you know, I think the team – exudes more confidence thanks to him. I just think he's made an enormous difference on the team. And, you know, it showed throughout this series. You know, when you're watching these big games and, and you kind of, you know, you get all caught up in it, it just, it feels a lot different than it has the last couple of years. And I think he's a, a huge reason why. Ben Attendee, 386 in his last 22 games. Three, huh? I mean, so. he's having a good season. I can't believe he wasn't an all-star, but. Well, it's neither here nor there. You're right. Um, that said, he, he looked rather, other than spiking his helmet, he looked rather disinterested last night Very tame. after winning the game. Very tame. Yeah. And Tony Renda coming around from second base. <laughs> Tony, yeah. I bet there are a lot of people that are just wondering, what was, who is this guy? I was kind of like, bummed like, we won generic, it in the 10th because uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to see a Dan Butler at bat. <laughs> I did too. Well, how about <laughs> ESPN? But ter- there were some... Interesting moments, I guess. Yeah, not in that broadcast. Roller coaster of a broadcast. And to their, you know, in their defense, you, you, you might start losing your fastball a little bit after five hours. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> uh, and clearly they did because by the end of it, they were throwing meatballs. Uh, Va- Matt Vasquezian, uh, who I just the don't tying, like, tying run was coming to the plate when Yankees were up three and at the plate. Yeah. Uh, then he, he overlooked Christian Vasquez's injury and yep. said that he was available off the bench. Uh, he had A-Rod pumping Paul O'Neill's tires like nothing I've ever seen before in my he, life. He, he mentioned got the, Paul O'Neill about 45 times. He got the deficit wrong, said the, the Yankees came in down four and a half games. Four and a half games. Which was, you know, which was wrong. I mean, and there were a lot as I was watching it, and I was like, you guys are wrong again. He, my, one of my all-time favorites was him claiming that Alex Cora is uh, he's impossible to play against <laughs> and very difficult. <laughs> so, you know, the impossible wasn't enough for you. It was also very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was just, they were all over the place. But, you know, whatever. I did like, I did like the Jess Mendoza bit where, uh, you know, she kind of had the stones to go right out there and, 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 and rip the Astros saying they traded integrity rather than prospect yeah, for Asuna. Yeah, that was good. I agree with her on that, too. And, you know, that's, you know, that's a bold thing to do on, you know, on ESPN, who has a multi-billion dollar deal with MLB, a Disney company. You know, you have to believe. Especially, you know, I don't know if you watch the pregame show at all, but it, it seemed very much so like Mark Desher and David Ross were kind of trying to play both sides of the fence a little bit. Right. Know, justify to some extent the Astros bringing in Ozuna, but also, you know. For those that don't know what we're talking about. They don't support domestic right. violence, you know what I mean? Like, right, and for those that don't know what we're talking about, Roberto Ozuna is a former closer for the Blue Jays. Uh, had a 60-game suspension this season uh, for his role in of domestic violence case we don't still don't know uh it's the legal stuff is still ongoing we don't know the details or anything but 
you know, there seems to be something there. And he was suspended for 60 games. And a lot of teams at the trade deadline ran from that, but the Houston Astros ran to it, traded to him, yeah. uh, sort of going against their own the zero tolerance policy when it comes to domestic violence. So there's been a, a big hubbub over whether, you know, you know, w- what that ultimately means and, and whether the, the, the Astros sort of sacrifice parts of their soul yeah. to go get zero a Zero tolerance, unless it doesn't happen on your watch, in which right. case you're just the- Zero tolerance, but we chance. believe in second chances. So yeah. the, the math doesn't really Makes work sense. out. Um, but I thought it was, you know, I thought it was cool that Mendoza went, went right after it. It's definitely got to be a kind of an awkward or, you know, weird topic to talk about on national TV, but. Oh yeah. You know, that was a good part of that broadcast, but overall roller coaster. And I do not like, I still can't pronounce his name, the play-by-play guy. Discursion? Ooh. How do you pronounce like it? Yeah, I just I don't like him. <laughs> he just sounds like a video, like a like a generic well, I think vanilla. He, I think video he has game done announcer. video games. Yeah, he did the show, right? He yeah, he does the show, and that's that's all he should it? ever I do. I haven't, I haven't played video games in so long. Whenever yeah. I'm watching, I, and I hear him, like I'm just hearing pre-recorded responses <laughs> from a, on a video game. It's like Red Sox have gone one and four over the last. <laughs> yeah, like, just, you know, like, yeah, just the puzzle. Blank. It's like a Mad Libs. Yeah. So I'm not, I don't know, that's a weird bro. I do like A-Rod for the most part. He can be pretty awkward. Like, there's cringe moments with him. Yeah. Where he just, I don't know, the stuff he says and his, the way he says it and his face sometimes can get pretty cringeworthy. I also wish he was a little bit more of a jerk. You know what I mean? Like, I, this. Yeah. It, it seems to like when they brought up the uh, the whole Jason Veritek brawl and, like, it's almost like he's, like, trying to, like, Get penance now, like, like ah, you know, there's water under the bridge. Right. Like, you just get so caught up in things, and it just tries to be like too nice. Where deep down, it's like you were a scumbag a few years ago. Like, let's not lose but sight of that. And he's always been a narcissist. Like, he he cares so much about what other people think about him. He's like LeBron James in that respect. That you'll never get, you'll never get him to say anything like that. Yeah. He just wants everybody to like him, and then that's that's his biggest flaw. But not to not to go down the A Rod rabbit hole. Anyway, so do you agree? Uh, we'll, just, we'll, we'll end with this: that this thing's locked up. Red Sox are your AL East champions. Uh, no. You seem to be leaning towards. Uh, you still having questions there? I don't have questions about the team or the Red Sox. You know, I, I mean, I do have some questions, but I, I think the Red Sox are better, and I don't I don't doubt the Red Sox ability to close it. I just don't believe the Yankees are going to be this bad for the rest of the season. So you 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 better keep up this pace because, you know. It, I'm just saying it can flip. We've seen it. We've seen we've seen big collapses, um, and I just you know I'm not I'm not ready to say it's over yet. I am. It's over. I mean I don't blame you for it. And I don't blame fans for feeling that it's way. Over. I'm a little more pessimistic. Uh, just, but you know proceed cautiously. If that thing stay is down, healthy, get your rest. Line up your rotation. Get guys in there the roles that need to be in, and then get your foot on the gas come October. If that because thing really, gets down, none to, of this is going to matter anyways. It's, right. I mean, We've seen it back-to-back seasons where they get to the playoffs and flame out. So <laughs> they've, they've, they've taken care of business here, or it should uh, have taken care of business here, and it's, then it's on to the real deal. I'm just saying, if that gets down to four or five games at the end of the season when those, when those Yankee series come up, you, know, you, don't, you don't want that to happen. You want to keep this lead. You don't want to get this thing down below six again. No. Keep it between six and nine. Let's not lose sight, too, that the Red Sox are 44 and a half games ahead of the Baltimore Orioles. That's so. a, yeah. Are the, are the Orioles mathematically eliminated yet? Uh, so they still could come I gotta back. Get my calculator out, but <laughs> I think it's just a few games away. They they certainly they, their turnaround needs to start now. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> t- I mean, they've been laying in the weeds here, been laying in the grass for a little bit. It's time for them to strike if they're going to do anything. <laughs> All right, let's get the hell out of here. Um, Thanks, everyone. If you uh, listened all the way through, if you didn't, then, you know, you're really going to check your priorities. You've got to start doing that. <laughs> uh, but we'll be back next week, I'm sure, uh, provided we're still uh, here and doing what we do. So, uh, all right, Red Sox going on the road now. Yep, Th- uh, three so, with the Blue Jays. So we'll and then back. Yep, they get, uh, they get the, the Jays coming up starting Tuesday night. Uh, then they got the Orioles, the aforementioned juggernauts. One thing to hit on that we didn't get to real quick, Chris Sale will not start against the Blue Jays. Most of us just assume now that there's a comfy lead in the AL East, they're kind of giving them extra rest. But something to keep, keep an eye on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that situation it's, makes me a little uncomfortable. But like you said, get them the rest of the needs. Anyways, we're going to get the rest that we need. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you. Uh, we won't see you, but we'll talk to you. And we'll talk to you next week. All right. Till next Red time. Sox podcast. That's Dakota Randall. Where are you on Twitter? Uh, at Jack Randall. Cool. As always. Awesome. At the Ricky Doyle here. 
Follow at Nesson. Goodbye.